Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Rubin with Ad Hoc with the Doc, and today we have an extremely special episode here talking to one of my mentors, Dr. Neil Reardon. Thank you for coming here. It's really special to be able to talk to you about this. Sure, long, man. long ago we got to work together. You taught me huge amounts of stuff, helped me learn how to think about oncology and how to approach the, the whole approach a patient and just to approach the whole ology. And so thank you for that. Tell me about a lot about IV vitamin C, about the immune system. And now we're sitting here talking about stem cells, which I know very little about. I know through you most of what I know. And um, I just really, on this ad hoc with the doc, would love to just talk about what types of stem cells uh, you study, uh, you develop, you, you uh, how you go about harvesting or propagating. I know there are mesenchymal stem cells, and there's a difference of those, and there's different types of stem cells out there. And so first off, how did you become interested in stem cells in general many years ago? Um, well, you know, we used to make dendritic cell vaccines, and to make bigger, better dendritic cell vaccines, you needed to start with another kind of stem cell called the HSC, hematopoietic okay. stem cell, which is what you use if you're going to do a bone marrow transplant. In oncology, okay. is probably the largest use of bone marrow transplants. There are some autoimmune diseases that they do. But <clears throat> so you can get those from the bone marrow? CD34s <clears throat> can fully restore the blood cell-making system in the body. So okay. that's what a bone marrow transplant is. So, um, wipe out the, you know, the HSCs of a person and give them donor HSCs and without getting too much into it, that's not what we do. Okay. We don't use chemotherapy and we don't uh, wipe out anybody's immune system. We use the other major group of stem cell in the body, which is called the MSC, mesenchymal stem cell. We just say MSC. MSC, okay. Yeah. And so those are found everywhere in your body. You know, they, they line the blood vessels. Every capillary, the smallest blood vessels in your body, is surrounded by them. And, um, on the outside? On the outside, yeah. So actually they control blood pressure. They control, they're, they're the master controllers of homeostasis or you know, trying to normalcy in the body. And as we age or as you know, certain illnesses are associated with messed up MSCs, and as we age, we just run out of them. So it's a combination of, you know, if you're, if you're quite ill for quite some time, um, Certainly, most autoimmune diseases have uh, a, a dysfunctional. The MSCs are not working properly. Is there a way to, to <clears throat> quote, like talk to them or send them a message? In is there that part of stem there, cell there's therapy? Ton, ton, yeah, there are tons of crosstalk between um, well, all the cells in our body, and the main re one of the main ways besides physical contact is secretions of the cells. And they secrete these small things, so cells this big, they secrete these little exosomes, little microvesicles, and that's a major, major way of communicating. Is it sort of, is an exosome like a little envelope packed full of information that they want to deliver to another cell? Yeah. I don't know if they consciously want to do it, but okay. they do um, Who, well, who does it? The MSCs make the exosomes. Yep. And then they send that somewhere else in the body. Right, right. So my point is, most interesting things that I've, that, that's ever come out since I've been doing this is the fact that MSCs can triage and deliver uh, mitochondria to wow. somatic cells. And um, it was done in a, in a, basically in an inflammatory, highly inflammatory, you know, they put, put something down <coughs> into the lungs of animals and then the, um, the, there's a lot of inflammation, and then the, the cells, there were dead cells, there were dying cells, and there were healthy cells. So the MSCs were able to triage those cells that had enough mitochondria to make it, and they would leave them alone. The cells that were didn't have enough mitochondria to make it, they would leave them alone. And the ones that were salvageable, they would form little microtubules and dump mitochondria into them. That's and, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and they also would, they also butt off these little things called microvesicles, which have mitochondria, are capable of carrying mitochondria, and then the microvesicles made out of the same membrane mm -hmm. that the that cell, you know, that 
basically the same membrane like uh, any mammalian cell, mm -hmm. and then it fuses with the recipient and releases the mitochondria into the cell. Does it act like a little storehouse for them when they need it, or do they release it generally all well, the Well, normally yeah. MSCs aren't acting, they aren't, they aren't, they don't actively do that, but okay. in this in this particular case where they demonstrated it, it was a very inflammatory situation. MSCs have they have natural ways of, of seeking out inflammation. Would this be a way to maybe treat people with mitochondrial disease? Well, actually, it is. We have um, we we're working on. Um, an IND right now, that's an uh, investigational new drug application for uh, the treatment of Lee syndrome, which is a mitochondrial disease. And we have um, a couple of patients that were treated under compassionate use that respond really well to MSC IV therapy. So we don't, you know, mechanistically, we don't know exactly what's going on, but um, clinically, there's vast improvement. Well, that's, that sounds a great and wonderful wonderful humanitarian work that you're doing. That's a treacherous disease. Yeah. And that's a disease most people don't survive that disease, if I Correct, remember yeah. right. I don't think any, well, yeah, the, most die in childhood. <clears throat> um, where, what is the source of the MSCs in that study, in the compassionate use? Is that autologous or is that... It's, uh, no, we're using um, umbilical cord, so... Mom has a baby, and the baby's delivered, and the umbilical cord's, you know, tied off and cut, and the baby's taken away, and then mom delivers the afterbirth, which is comprised of the placenta and the amnion and the umbilical cord, and we take the the basically the structural tissue of the umbilical cord mm -hmm. and dissociate it, and we that's that's our starting culture of MSCs, and we grow grow them up in large numbers, and then they're clinically applicable at that point. Do they survive quite a while in your cultures? Or do you have to preserve them before treatment? Well, they, yeah. So they're frozen down in a you know a okay. certain special medium that that makes you know makes it so that when they, you thaw them, they're still alive. So, um, but yeah, all all what we do is frozen down, um, and then in our clinic. We have um, we have a GMP um, syringe prep laboratory. Okay. So we have a freezer there. Our manufacturing facility is over by the canal. It's not in the city, and um, so we manufacture there, and we have shipments, regular shipments there, and then we have a, a crew, a team that will then wash the cells, get rid of the cryoprotectant, and suspend them, ready for application, and then they. It's right, literally built in the middle of our clinic, so it's uh, very oh, convenient. Wonderful. And the name of your clinic in Panama is what? The Stem Cell Institute. Stem cell Institute. Simple as that. <coughs> cell, cell Medicine, C E L L Medicine.com. Interesting. And I understand that you've authored now, is it seven books? No, I've only offered two, authored two, two books. books. <laughs> And no intent to author seven. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Well, I saw it yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw your book in... I think, think maybe you're thinking it's translated into seven different languages. Seven, yeah, that's yeah, what it was. Yeah. All right, I'll pick up a copy. And <laughs> copy. Dr. Reardon, so you're, we're sitting here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and you are in town because you have, or we had the dedication last night at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine for the Neil Reardon Regenerative Medicine Institute. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Oh, thanks, it's really, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, that's at the Naturopathic Medical School. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see you again, yeah. to be able to sit down and talk with you. I'd love to talk about some of the mechanisms of action of MSCs. And specifically, I get a lot of questions that people ask me about the use of them clinically. We're here mm -hmm. in the United States, obviously, and um, your main clinic, you have a clinic in Texas. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that clinic? It's called the Reared Medical Institute. Okay. <clears throat> Are you using stem cell therapy there? Yeah, we're using uh, bone marrow. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of good studies showing bone marrow can augment standard orthopedic conditions, also augment standard spine surgeries and procedures. So we use autologous bone marrow, so that's from the patient. Okay. So we have a device that spins it down very quickly so that... You, you know, the patient can be consciously sedated and we draw the bone marrow and uh, this machine takes two and a half minutes and it's ready to go 
And if we're doing a joint, for example, you just do it in the same procedure. And so if they're having like a joint re surgery? Yeah, bo both surgery and in-office non-surgical okay. um, procedures we do. Uh, we do a lot more non-surgical than we do surgical. But we have an orthopedic surgeon that works with us. We have a um, board-certified pain guy, and we have a neurosurgeon that works with us. And so Excellent. the neurosurgeon, obviously, he's going <laughs> to surgery. Uh, but you can augment that, that healing process using bone marrow, placing it into where you have soft tissue damage. Uh, it's also used for, for helping to fuse, you know, if you have to do a fusion. And uh, then we also use amnion, which is, mm. you know, it's it's uh, <coughs> it's it's from the same birth tissue that we get, you know, the umbilical cords um, products. But it's it's exempt in the U.S. Amnion, as long as mm -hmm. it meets certain criteria, so we're able to use amnion, and we're able to use umbilical cord tissue. But it's not you can't you can't take that and then grow it and do okay. all the stuff we do in Panama <coughs> yet. I, I think ultimately it's going to be, it's going to be very common practice, but uh, there's an exemption for tissue. It's called the 361 under federal regulations. And, um, and uh, so that's what we're able to do here. The reason we even moved to Panama is they, in 2004, they passed a law that allowed for it basically banned embryonic stem cell research and treatment. Okay. And at the same time, it, it enabled adult stem cell research and treatment. So it's from that 2004 law that we were able to build our laboratory and get fully licensed by the government, and um, and now things, you know, now things are getting, you know, it's maturing a lot in in the regula regulatory environment. Is is quite strict, but um, you know <clears throat> we're uh, we're kind of an institution down there, and um, we employ a lot of people. We 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 work a lot. We collaborate a lot with with the the other folks down there, and um, I would so. imagine you have a lot of people flying in from either out of the country or out of state to come get treated by you, both in Texas and <clears throat> down in Panama. Right. Right. Yeah, Wonderful. in Panama, that we you know we we do, we probably bring in about now we're between two hundred and two hundred fifty patients a month uh, that come from all over the place and um, you know a lot from the U.S., <coughs> Canada, Australia, mostly English-speaking countries, mm -hmm. and then so we have a nucleus that comes from uh, the Arab countries as well. But um, so we have an e economic impact, and you know we're our our clinic is on the 63rd floor of a 65-story building and then we're at that building is attached to a Hilton hotel Excellent. and we represent around 30 percent of the business of the hotel and um, and we're now now we've exceeded our capacity there so we're well, building we're building a new clinic at another hospital at a hospital facility Excellent. Congratulations. And, uh, thanks and there's a hospital tower <coughs> it's really cool it's, it's all kind of self-enclosed it's on a one city block. There's a there's a hospital tower, yeah. state of the art. There's a there's a uh, an office tower, which is we have the top floor of the office tower. There's a hotel tower. There's a movie theater. There are several restaurants. There's a grocery nice. store. So you don't even have to leave. Uh, wow, you just stay inside the whole time. Yeah, or I mean it's a whole it's whole complex. So, nice. but. Uh, since traffic is sometimes challenging, it's a really looking forward to that. We're, we're also looking forward to we have so many patients going up and down the elevator that oh. we, we, we're just, we're, we're really stuck. So they gave us, that was one of the conditions of us putting a place there is they, we got our own elevator. So we don't That's have to share it with anybody else. Is there a typical treatment length of time if people were to come to Panama that they could? Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, for, for rheumatoid arthritis, for multiple sclerosis, for frailty of aging, for heart failure, we it's based on basically cell dosing, and cell okay. dosing is based on weight. But for the average person, they 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 need to be treated for between three and four days. So okay. a typical okay. thing is somebody will fly down on a Sunday. If they've never been there before for the first treatment, then we have to evaluate them and do blood work and do a physical exam and you know just induct them into the process. And then on typically on Tuesday they'll get. 40 million cells IV, 
on Wednesday, 40 million, Thursday, 40 million, and then they can go home on Friday, but well, do, do another physical at the end, and then go. So most people are there for about five days. Wonderful. Uh, what about the anti-tumor characteristics of MSCs? Has that been studied? It, it has been studied. You know, what's interesting is, uh, it, and, and I, I want to talk to you about this afterwards, but uh, epidemiologically, if you take our patient population, it has a very low incidence of cancer, you know, and, and, hmm. and I, we're, we've talked to a couple different epidemiologists about doing the math on how many cases of malignancy you should have, but it's very, very rare. And, um, you know, I personally believe that many, many solid tumors and even some leukemias are, you know, well, there's certainly a lack of homeostasis going on. Um, there's active immune suppression. There's under, you know, immune, immune cells don't behave appropriately uh, it, when there's a clinical cancer. And since MSCs rule all that, or at least have something to do with it, um, my hunch is that the vast majority of cancers are secondary to either localized or systemic uh, dysfunction or depletion of MSCs. Because the, again, so can you use MSC therapy then potentially to treat somebody with an active malignancy? Potentially, yeah. I mean, we have, because um, I'll give you two parts on this. One okay. part is that MSCs contribute to tumor growth and metastases, particularly tumor growth. So they're stromal cells, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to their perivascular, they, they can become stromal cells. You so mean that the MSCs can be inside of tissues? In tumors, yeah. In tumors. Right. Do they normally reside in normal tissues? In every normal in tissue. In every normal tissue. Right. I just like to in, repeat that. Okay. Every, every, every blood vessel. So, so you, have, you have blood vessels <clears throat> pretty much everywhere in your body, and they reside on the blood vessels. And you have tumors that require blood vessel supply. Right. So they're yeah. inside of tumors, so it's continue. Sorry for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, trepidation, obviously, with something relatively new. And, and when you see that these cells are involved, then mm -hmm. it makes you worried, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's never been a study that showed that these cells were induced tumor formation. But there are several studies showing that the cells in the body participate in, in tumor growth and expansion. So uh, there's a great study done on where they took umbilical cord cells. So there's also a big difference between really young, healthy cells and cells in a body that's been through a lot. You mean MSCs? MSCs, okay. yeah, MSCs. So they, they in this particular study, they took um, they took. Um, MSCs that were grown from the adipo, from the fat tissue of adults, and then they took umbilical cord, the, the MSCs from umbilical cord, and grew them like we do. And then they took, a, I can't remember the model right off the top of my head, but the title tells it all. Um, adipose MSCs promote and umbilical cord MSCs inhibit tumor growth and blah, 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 Indeed. animal model. Right. Fascinating. And probably the most dramatic um, dramatic study was of rat breast cancer, and they used rat umbilical cord, or rat MSCs, umbilical cord, I think, I'm pretty sure, and they grew them up, and then they, you know, they implant a bunch of tumor cells in the flank, and then that becomes a primary tumor, and the, that, it's a very aggressive thing, and it typically metastasizes, and then the animals that have to be sacrificed and so you see the the tumor growth, and they gave they gave one dose into the tumor, and they gave or or and another group they gave three doses IV, and then they have controls for both of them. And you see the control; the tumor's going like this. And the treated group didn't matter which way they gave them; it goes up, and then it goes like this, and then back down. So there was no tumor. So the title of that uh, uh, article was something like the original tumors. Primary tumors disappeared, and there's no sign of metastases 100 days later. Wow. Which is never seen anything ever do that before. Um, wow. And the MSCs mm -hmm. communicate with the immune system then? 
Yeah. So what what they concluded in their mm-hmm. in their well the conclusion of that particular article, which was um, done at Kansas State University, was um, that they believed that the cancer stem cells had to have been destroyed or induced to apoptose or necrosed or whatever mm-hmm. in because of that result. Because typically you have cancer stem cells that then can cause metastases. And they, they hypoth they they're in their discussion that was their hypothesis of what happened in that. But case. a cancer stem cell can't revert to become a normal MSC like stem cell and behave appropriately. Well, I'm not sure. I don't think anybody knows the answer okay. to that. But um, one of the mechanisms of action is transference via exosomes, okay. uh, normal copies of p53, which is Interesting. A, a, a gene that induces, a, that basically tells the cell it's okay to go ahead and die. And can't so that p53, which is the message that tells the cell that it's okay to die. Cancer cells tend to have a damaged copy of p53 or lack it. Altogether, right. So you're saying that an MSC can say, "Hey, here's some info you might need," yeah, and exactly. give it to them. That's well put. Yeah, very, very fascinating. Um, what are some of the other projects that you're working on besides your research with Lee Syndrome and the clinic? And do you have any other research projects in the works? Well, we just finished um, our MS paper, uh, okay. which was a clinical trial of MS patients using um, using MSCs. Came out. Um, and the results are very good. The side effects were, if any, mild in some people. Um, then our autism study is just is completed, and we're in the throes of finishing t- finishing touches. We're going to submit that for publication here pretty soon. Our, we're a little bit down the road on our asthma trial. Um, our our frailty trial is going on. Our and our rheumatoid arthritis is continuing. And our osteoarthritis trial is continuing. Um, the sort of the number next for me, clinical trial wise in the U.S. So these are all U.S. based studies. No, those are all Panama. Panama okay. And then in the U.S. We're we're gonna soon file the IND for the Lee syndrome, but also we're gonna do um, a knee osteoarthritis study mm. using the Wharton's jelly product that we make. What's in, that in Dallas? Well, we mechanically dissociate the Warden's jelly, which is the, the source of the cells that we eat grow in Panama. Okay. But we can't, you know, since it's 361 exempt, we can't we can't grow them or anything like that. And we won't. We're applying for an IND to go 351 or, you know, basically you're going for a biologic license at that point for the non-expanded. I think you know strategically, FDA is going to be happier with. Um, a non-expanded product because there's there's okay. a lot of a lot more hoops that you have to jump through, so it's a minimally manipulated, um, um, mechanically dissociated product that has live cells in it that we will you know that are quantified and, are, and can be you know standardized for. Um, the autism study. Obviously, we can't talk about results, and mm-hmm. I'm not asking that. But I'm curious about the study design. Is that something you're able to talk about? Yeah, um, it was for a it was for a, um, a pretty tight group of severe autistic right-handed males between the age of six and twelve from the tri-state area because the the guy that recruited the doctor that recruited him was at NYU and so he recruited them and and uh, the trial design was uh, four treatments over a nine-month period so time zero. Time one is three months, time two is six, and nine months out, and then they were followed for one year after Excellent. that. Excellent. Well, I look forward to those results, and I yeah. think probably globally people do. Yeah. Very exciting. Dr. Reardon, Neil, you taught me long ago when we were at the clinic doing immunotherapy for people, you really introduced the notion of tumor as an unhealed wound. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hold that true today and think about that. And so many of the lab tests that we do and so many of the treatments that we do really attend to that phenomenon and disrupted angiogenesis, et cetera, and you know, how, just, how the healing process is disrupted. In terms of that sort of tumor-associated biology, do MSCs play a role in the healing process insofar as that 
tumors is an unhealed mm-hmm. wound. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. I mean, they're the key to, they really are the key to healing. So <laughs> they go in first and, and, and they, and you know, when we're young, I'll just use this analogy. Like when you were young, you probably fell down and you, yeah. you had a friend that fell down and broke his leg or arm or her leg or arm. And you pretty much don't need to do anything, you know, when you're 14 years old. And when you're 84, you're lucky if it even knits, you know what I mean? Because that's your... Absolutely. Your, your, uh, that's the frailty of aging that you're talking about, too. Well, frailty of aging, but, you know, your MSCs go like this with age. And 50, that, that slope gets real steep, you know. And uh, Arnie Kaplan, the, the my mentor and the guy who named these cells MSCs at, up in Cleveland... Um, he, he, he estimates that from birth until we used his age at the time because I asked him a question when I was writing my book, um, the, the Rising Tide, um, he, I was like, Arnie, I know capillary density goes down with, with time and, you know, with age. And I know that, you know, MSCs live on capillaries. So ergo, our total body number of MSCs is going to decline with age. Right. How much is that? I can't find it anywhere in the literature. I spent days trying to find capillary density decline with age and it doesn't exist. And he said, well, I can tell you my best guess, best guess. Because he's a musculoskeletal guy, so he's looking at tissues all the yeah. time. And he says, in the skin, I can tell you exactly, I can tell you the exact number in the skin. Because in a baby, you have all these, you know, the there's all this up and down like almost like looking like villi so you get this folding of the capillary mm-hmm. bed and as we age that folding disappears and then ultimately it's just flat and then you know the skin gets thin and all the stuff and he said he said we did mine when i was 72 and was probably and i'm sitting at two percent of the capillary density as of a newborn wow. so that's for the skin so anyway it's a pretty pretty massive decline um and and if that is happening in all the tissues in your body, then the um, then those MSCs aren't around to heal the wound anymore. You know, Absolutely. and if you look at chronic inflammation, then the, these cells are involved in trying to heal the wound. And if you have chronic inflammation, you're exhausting this pool of them, and this pool is is throughout your body roughly evenly distributed um, your liver has the most being you know very very uh, uh, having so many blood vessels your spinal cord has the least given that it's um, we built this wonderful cage to pre- prevent damage to it and the likelihood of you surviving an insult to it is so low mother nature or god didn't waste a whole lot of energy putting mm. blood vessels in there so just barely enough to support it and that's why spinal cord injury, I didn't, oh. when you have spinal cord injury, Charles ran on too. Spinal cord injury, all we do is we take, we take cells, young healthy cells that secrete stuff that stimulate regeneration, and we put them in that space. That's all we do. It's not, and let it ain't go. rocket science. Right. They put it like that. So there, there was a study where, where they, in, in Taiwan, where they cut, cut um, uh, spinal cords like that, and they go, boink, and then they took, put cells right in there. They put, human umbilical cord MSCs in a fibrin, like, you know, a biologic gel. Yeah. And then sure enough, the, the, mm-hmm. they sprouted again, right? And that's all that was there. And they imitated the this, this structure of the tissue? Well, they, they reconnected. The, the, the neurons reconnected. Interesting. So, well, the whole spinal cord reconnected <coughs> to a certain degree. So all the cells participated in the regenerative process. And then because they were human, they were able to fish, you know, stain the stain the tissue afterwards mm-hmm. after the repair occurred <laughs> and they showed there were human cells certainly they were still there but none of them incorporated into the cns they were just they were they were essentially prisoners between fibers got it and so um it's it's a they are what heals the body you know and you know it, so that's that's why your liver you know that you pluck out 80 percent of your liver and it'll re- regrow interesting right? right whereas your spinal cord you go like that and it's not very happy. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. So as a clinician, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to your wonderful stories, and I'm wondering, especially regarding the frailty of aging that you're talking about, 
you know, you start thinking about whether or not there's nutrients that support your stem cells or there's certain diet strategies. I don't know if these have been figured out, but you know, people ask me that kind of stuff all the time about you know, what diet, what should I eat? And I just, I'm, I'm guessing that there's the general array of nutrients that MSCs respond to and need. <clears throat> and so that's kind of sort of question number one. Is there anything, Not we're not talking about prescribing something for somebody, but are, you know, is a good healthy diet reasonable when people are starting to think about MSCs and frailty of aging? Because I've noticed that generally in my practice, uh, and when uh, I practice with you, there was a commonality of certain older people, usually over the age of about 72, that despite them having a diagnosis of cancer, generally appeared healthier and more vital. And those were the people that generally took B vitamins and garlic you mm-hmm. know, from being young adults. And they were into health or they made juice. And so it always struck me. I never connected it between, you know, with MSCs. I don't know if it has anything to do with stem cells. Um, that's part one, and I actually forgot part two. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, um... So I'll use one of my father's axioms, Dr. Hughes' axioms. So I remember your father. He would, yeah. He would, he he would, he did this more than once. He would say, and he'd given a lecture. He'd hold up his hand. He said, "Okay, <laughs> what's the most important nutrient?" And then, of course, he did all the vitamin C stuff. And then people would say vitamin C and zinc and magnesium and whatever, you know. And he said, "You're all wrong." The most important nutrient is the one you're out of. And that's, I mean, it's pretty true. So I think the best thing is to test people to see, make, make sure they're not out of something. Very nice. And in our autism study, I can tell you, not in our autism study, but in our autism patient pool, I can tell you the ones that get better, they um, get get the mo better. <laughs> the, mo better. Uh, the ones that literally go from being severely autistic to not autistic, Almost to a person, they've been to uh, another. They've been to a practitioner that m- cleaned them up, made sure they didn't have any heavy metals. By the way, we have a cutoff. If you're at, if your heavy metals, they measure lead and mercury. If they're above a certain level, we don't we don't take you. You have to fix that in the trial or at the institute. Across the board. Okay. So the reason is because they're very toxic. Mercury is the most toxic molecule to MSCs. On the planet, it's parts per billion that kills them. So, and and we have kids with mercury loads coming down. It's like, hey, there there's no reason to do this because the likelihood of success is way lower than if you just get your kid in a normal, you get his his or her blood level down low enough where it's not going to harm the cell. So, the, the you know heavy metals are are no bueno for MSCs. And then, if you take one nutrient, one vital nutrient out of the out of the culture medium, they just quit growing. Wow! So it doesn't matter which one. You can take out any one you want, and it doesn't, doesn't matter which one they will halt. The, some of them more quickly than others. Glutamine is the number one. You know, if you don't if you don't have enough glutamine, you'll just everything will just fall off a cliff real quick. Fascinating. Yeah. Sorry, that's fascinating to me. All right, last question because I know it's uh, we've been talking a long time. It's been a long day. Are there any genomics associated with higher or lower or more efficient or less efficient uh, MSCs or longevity or anything that you're aware of? Um, there probably are some, um, but um, it needs to be looked at further. There's certainly there, there's a very big difference in the clinical efficacy of, of different lots of MSCs. So if there's one thing I think that we figured out that nobody else has is what markers to look for, and they're not genetic markers. We look at we look at uh, other markers in the cells. Um, we did big three-year study, and we and we were able to figure out what's different, what what are what molecules are underexpressed, and overexpressed in highly clinically effective cells, and so now we're able to screen at an early stage and get uh, get rid of all those. But I you know. When I look at the autism study, the people that the the clients that we treat, you know, some of them get become non autistic. Some of them go from being severe to mild moderate. Amazing. Some of them don't don't move at all. So I'd really like to know genomically mm-hmm. um, if if there's a difference those from those super responders and moderate responders 
non-responders? Are, My guess is there is, but we haven't done this. Is it the you know, Well, the MSCs that they're receiving are donor MSCs. Mm -hmm. So there could be a difference in the genomics of the donors uh, in mm -hmm. association with the genomics of the individual with which they're implanted. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then to study that, you... You have to take infinity and square it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my God, absolutely. Well, any comments before we sign off? Well, I'm just I'm happy to see you, man. It's been a, been a while, and, and uh, I'm happy to see you're doing so well and doing so many great things with oncology. And I just saw you, you had some students in here, and you're, you're spreading the word and taking care of people, and I'm just really happy to see you and proud of you. Thank you. Likewise, and thank you for what you're doing in just how you've advanced science and treatment of people. I know what's deep in your heart and how much you enjoy helping people. And I know how, I, I just know that that stems from your family. I've known you a long time. Thank you for what you're doing for the naturopathic profession. And, you know, for what I'm doing, thank you for helping be a mentor of mine and helping to teach me how to think and to really go out there and help people. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Thanks, man.